speaker is Weiwei Shi uh, from LSU. Uh, and, uh, thank you for coming. Okay, good morning, everyone. So you can hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Weiwei. I'm from Louisiana State University. It's my great honor to be here and give the lecture. And today I'm going to talk about how to use chemistry way to make the new materials. Okay, so Prof Professor Brancells already told us how to really make the materials. And I will just uh, like uh, very quickly to uh, brief to talk about how to really make the material. Uh, what I'm going to talk about how to come up with the idea and have the goal of the material and to make it. Okay, so. We talk a lot about quantum materials, quantum materials. So what are quantum materials? Quantum materials, we can think about quantum materials as the material which has a very interesting electronic properties and which are related to their like spin, charge, topology, lattice or orbitals. And these materials, they may also have very interesting magnetic and electro, uh, electrical properties and heat or mechanical properties. Okay, so for the physics, physics try to uh, make the new material and then find the interesting or new physics pheno physical phenomena and try to understand them so that's their goal for chemistry our goal is also very straightforward and simple is we try to make new compounds or new materials which is never been reported in the database okay we're coming from nothing <laughs> okay so how can we come up with these ideas is usually we have a targeted properties okay we have a targeted properties for example we have topologic insulators or superconductivity so this is our goal and then we try to translate translate this concept of physics into the chemical requirements for example structure or electron counting rules or chemical bondings and then we use the inorganic synthesis like the flux growth, trans vapor transport, all kinds of methods try to make this new material. After we make the new material, we usually calculate the electronic structure and to understand their property. And the most important, important thing is we try to modify our chemical requirements and for the future synthesis. Okay, so this is our loop. And today I'm going to talk about the two materials. One is a topologic material, one is a new superconductors. And we use very chemistry intuition, the electron counting rules to count the electrons and make the new material. Okay. So let's start it from the, I think from chemistry way, let's start it from the topologic material. It's more straightforward. And for chemistry, it's simple to make. Okay. So again, What's the topologic quantum materials? Topologic quantum materials is, if we want to say it very simple, is the material. It has the different electronic properties with different dimensions. Okay, let's take topologic insulator, for example. The three dimension topologic insulator is for the bulk. So the 3D, right? It's insulator. But for if we measure that surface, the surface, because the band has been protected, so it can conduct, oh, so, sorry. It can conduct, electric, conduct electricity. So for the bulk, it's insulator. For the surface, it's a conductor. So we call it like a topologic material. They have a different properties. And uh, let's look at a very detailed example. That's the business. Okay, so what we want to see is for the bismuth, this is the three dimension of the brilliant zone of the bismuth. And we calculate the bulk band structure. Here, this is the bulk band structure with spin orbital coupling. Can you see there is a clear band gap for the 3D? Okay, and now we want to look at the two dimensional, uh, two -dimensional uh, electronic property. So if we want to look at the material of two dimension, we can have different ways. We can look at from the one zero zero. We can look at from one zero zero one. We can look at from the one one zero or one one one. Different angles. Okay. So if we look at the surface states from the different angles, do they show the same or similar properties? So here, this is zero zero one. The surface band calculation, and you can see co uh, compare with the bulk states. Did you, did you see the clear green lines? 
the green, the extra green line, that's the surface state. Okay, that's the surface state. This is from the zero, zero, 001. And did you see here? 1101. One, and then there is also extra states. That's the surface states. And this surface states, that has a beautiful crossing. Okay, so for the bug, it's gap. For the two-dimension surface state, we have a beautiful crossing being protected by the symmetry. So they have the different properties. Okay, so that's kind of topologic material. And there are many types of topologic materials. So it, we have topologic insulator, we have direct semi-metal. It's direct semi-metal for the bug, two points, and for the surface, it's a loop. Okay, wire semi-metal, wire semi-metal you can think about is like the chiral structure of the chiral for the uh, direct semi-metal. It's just a split. And we also have nodal line. It's a loop on the, on the bulk and then uh, like an area on the surface. Okay. So this is the topological material. And if we want to put some magnetism into the topologic, we have more and more different properties. Okay. It becomes much more complicated. So this is very, uh, like we call it, quality ways to see the topologic. And some people will say, hey, we are physics. No, I'm not physics. I'm, I'm chemist. So physics will say, hey, wait, wait, okay, is there any quantitative ways to tell if this material is topological or not? So the most common way people look at the topologic materials is they try to calculate there is a parameter. It's called Z2 invariant. Okay, this, what's this mean? Okay, I, I make a two. So it's basically it's they're calculating their surface band structure. Okay, here there are two different surface band band. Okay, I, that's my drawing. Basically, what it looks like is we have. Okay, so what we have here is this is the two dimensional surface uh, Brillouin zone. One is the Kx, and one is the Ky. Okay. And we draw a line, we have two types. One is called trivial, one is called non-trivial. And the KY, okay, here, what I did is, so, so what's this mean about the two pi, zero two pi is, it's like two dimension, but we don't want to just look at it in the two dimension. We can make a row, so this is like cylinder. So first of all, we make a cylinder. And at this point, we can think as zero, and this end is two pi, right? Okay, everyone can follow? And okay, so this the paper is too small. We cannot really roll it. But if we keep rolling it, so this point is zero, and this point is two pi. Okay, so that's the two pi, zero, two pi coming from. Okay, so it's zero, two pi coming from. And then, okay, now everyone, you imagine yourself as an electron. Okay, you imagine yourself as an electron. And if we have a trivial band, okay, we call trivial band. What it look like is, it's like this way. Okay, and uh, if we look at it here, it's like there. Okay, this is called trivial band. And now we are the electron, right? So electron, so what's meaning is the gap, is gap is we don't need to touch the band. We think this is the band, okay? So as electrons, our goal is we try to get from zero to two pi, from this one to this one. And is there any way we go directly without touching the green line? Yes, right. So we can go here, there, everywhere, right? So this is called trivial, okay? So what's called non-trivial? Okay, so if our surface band is like this way, and now we are electrons here, and we want to cross to here. Is there any way, like we don't touch the green line? No, right? We have to touch. No matter where you go, you have to touch. Okay, so once you touch, you think about it. We meet with the band, it's conductor. Okay, <laughs> so that's the Z2. In, uh, it's, this is the Z2 invariant. And for the trivial, this, this D2 usually is zero. And for the uh, non-trivial, it's one. Okay, so this is the normal way we calculate if this is the topologic or non-topologic. And we also call this calculation called the Wilson loop. Okay, so this is the concept of physics. And uh, it's, 
if we go to the lab, as we see, lab we have elements, we have furnace, and we don't have the Fermi surface. And we need to translate, okay? We need to translate the concept of the physics into the chemical ways, and then we can make it, okay? So what's meaning of the narrow bed gap? So first of all, if we need to make the topologic materials or topologic, topologic insulator, we need a narrow bed gap. The bed gap is too big, it's not good. It's usually, it's, if it comes across, it's not very good. So we need a narrow band gap semiconductors or semi-metals. Okay, in chemistry way, we call it charge balanced, right? Okay, now this is what you understand. And then we also need the band crossing. So the band crossing, how can we generate this band crossing is we need heavy elements. It has a very strong spin orbital couplings. So where is the heavy elements? like 4D, 5D, like the 4S, 4P, 6S, 6P. Now we, make, we can make it in details into the elements, okay? So we need the robust surface band. So this band crossing on the surface, it needs to be protected by symmetry, okay? It needs to be protected by symmetry. So what's that mean? That means it's less better to make some specific compound with specific crystal structure, okay? So that's all. And how can we make it? I know it sounds very hard, but actually it's very easy. So at, when we were in middle school, we talked about charge balance compound. What's the charge balance compound? We, we know the first, maybe the sodium chloride, right? So, so this is the periodic table. I mark the color according to the electron activities. So here is the sodium, here is chloride. And if we put sodium chloride, it'll make the insulator, the band gap is over 8 EV, so it's too big, okay? 8 EV, it's too big. Now we want to narrow down the band gap. How can we narrow down the band gap? So we can decrease the electron negativity difference. Okay, so here is the sodium, here is the chloride. The electron negativity difference is too big. And how can we narrow down the electron activities? And also we need to use heavy elements. So we can use the bismuth, okay. We can use the bismuth, sodium and the bismuth, potassium with bismuth, and cesium with the bismuth, okay. However, these peop people have come up with this idea in 2012. So they already discovered, this is the very uh, interesting direct semi-metal. And in 2014, it has been proved, okay. And then can we ca uh, come up with other ideas? If sodium works, how about magnesium? If it's the magnesium, we have the magnes magnesium with the bismuth. What kind of compound we can form? If form the charge balance? Okay, so magnesium is two plus, right? And the bismuth forms three minors. So that's magnesium three, bismuth two. So, okay, so this is the idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's look at the magnesium bismuth too. Okay, magnesium through bismuth too. It, so first of all, uh, magnesium is not that air sensitive and bismuth is a good flux. Do you remember what uh, Dr. Brad Sells talked about flux growth? So what we do is, if we want to make the material, what can we do is we can put a lot of bismuth and with the magnesium and then make the, the single crystal. Okay, this is how we make the single crystal. And this material is a typical layered compounds. And it has a magnesium two plus layer with a magnesium bismuth layer, and a magnesium two plus layer, magnesium bismuth layer. So it's very easy to cleave, and it's not air sensitive. And it's very easy to make, even like me, a chemist, we can make a relatively large crystals, okay? So, <laughs> okay. So this is the material we made it. And do you remember, if we want to prove this is a topologic material, what kind of things we need to do? First of all, we need to calculate the bulk band, right? So we calculate the bulk band and we apply the spin orbital coupling. Did you see? There is a small gap coming from. Okay, there is a gap here. Okay, this is a bulk band. Now let's look at the surface band. So the surface band is, yes, we see there is a very beautiful topologic surface band crossing here and here. Okay, so what's mean type one, type two band crossing? So if we have a band, for example, like this way, 
This is the first band. If we want to have a second band to cross with them, there are two ways to cross. One is going this way. Okay. And the other one is going this way. And this kind of cross is the type one. And this kind of cross is the type two. Okay, so this is type one, type two. Okay, so like what I said, this is just the very quantitative. We need to go to the very quanti quantitative ways to prove if this is a topologic insulator. So we need to calculate the Wilson loop. And let's see, do you remember what we talked about? If we have electrons, we want to go from here to here. Is there any way we can avoid these blue lines? No, we cannot, right? So we have to cross it. And here, the red one. Yes, we can. So the red one is without spin orbital coupling, the blue one is with spin orbital coupling. And see, that's a big difference. So it proves, theoretically, it's a topologic, topologic insulator, right? Okay, but the other things we wanted to do is we want to really measure it. We want to see from the experiment. So we did the RPAS measurement. So later, I think on Thursday, we will have the RPAS, uh, introduction to RPAS measurements. Okay, so now you can see the pictures. RPAS is a super powerful measurement to get the band structure. And this is our theoretical band structure from the DFD calculation. And this is experiment one. We get it from the image. See, it's very beautiful. And we can see all these topologic loops. Okay, now you get it? Is that hard? No, right? It's <laughs> okay, so if we, okay, now, now as a chemist, I ask you, if we need to put the magnet, uh, magnetism into the system, what can we do? Okay, so we have A site. This is also magnesium site, right? Do you remember? And we have bismuth site, we also have magnesium site. And basically, is we don't want to replace the bismuth because bismuth gives the good spin uh, orbital coupling. And what we can do is, here we have the magnesium. We can replace the magnesium using the Euro, uh, europium. And the europium is magnetic, okay? And the other thing is here, this magnesium can be replaced by the manganese. Okay, this is also magnetic. And we can keep going, keep going, keep going, play the charge uh, balance, uh, play the charge balance game. And we can get a lot, lot of materials and which may have the interesting properties. So uh, beyond charge balance, what other considerations do you, do you have when you try to substitute okay. the elements, right? Magnesium or europium, for example. Okay, so beyond this one is here why we write the magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, europium is um, if you read here, uh, Professor Julia Chen is here. When, yeah, she did a lot of work on the europium and this like zinto phase. And the europium has a similar size as the strontium 2 plus. So that's why we like to replace the strontium use the europium if we want to give the magnetization. Okay. And the other consideration we have is we want to keep this uh, C3. Rot uh, C3 rotations in the uh, structure. Okay, so, so like what I said is in the beginning, we need to have some spe special structure protection. Okay, it's not necessary to be C3, but usually C3 give a very good structure protection. And if we look at the cubic structure, the body diagonal has a C3 rotation. And this rhombohedral structure, trigonal structure, they always give the C3. Yeah, it's not always right, but it gives you higher success for rays. So that's what we usually do. Okay. So, yeah. So, if you go back to your previous slide, I have a question about. So, there's presumably two terminations you could have when you create the surface yes. experiments. One that's manganese and magnesium, one that's one that is bismuth. Yes. Now, even if the material wasn't topological, you could have just because of uncompensated bonds, <coughs> surface states just due to the fact that you have broken bonds, right? When you create a surface. Yes. So is there a technique where you can distinguish between surface states that are topological and surface states that aren't? Um, so far, okay. So that's the, that's the thing is when we are doing the experiment, right? If you cleave the surface is, so this is the question. Uh, actually, I didn't do the RPAS work. I just do some calculation work. So 
in the beginning, that's what I can come up with. Okay, if we clear the surface, we have the magnesium and the bismuth. So which one is the right one? That's why we do the two calculations. And we know the C axis usually is the easy axis, so we don't need to consider other uh, direction. However, I bring this question to the RPAS people. This RPAS people give me a very interesting answer. He said, oh, wait, wait, you know, when we cleave it, so we take the magnesium and the bismuth go upside, right? So like we cleave it. So here, there is the problem is for them is they see the magnesium and they see the bismuth half to half ratio. So they cannot distinguish it. Basically, it's they cannot distinguish it. If you see half of the magnesium termination, you see half of the uh, bismuth termination. Okay, but later we have a new material. That's the European tin 2 phosphor 2. So that's a different case. Now we have three elements. They can tell the difference. They can tell which the face is a clear face. But for this one, yeah. But you would only see, you know, from let's say just photo emission, you just see spectra from a surface state. But my mm. question is, that, is there a way to distinguish that it is a topologically protected state versus just a surface state? Oh, oh okay. Oh, now I understand your question. I see. Uh, okay, so so okay. Your question is, you want to see which one is the topological states, right? Okay, so what we do is basically is we do the theory calculation, and then this is the theory calculation, and we tell them this is the topologic states. That's what we we discuss with them. We tell them this is the topologic states, and they tell me, okay, this is the topologic state. This is this one you absorbed. So it's 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 always the theory and the RPS together. Okay. Yeah, it's always there together. There's also chirality mm -hmm. and, and spin resolved resolve. measurements yeah. you can do to further check it's not a trivial surface state. Yes, yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, the charge balance always works very well if it works. However, for intermetallic, we have a problem is a lot of intermetallic, we cannot assign oxidation states. So for example, here, tantalum, iridium, germanium. Okay, tantalum, iridium, germanium in the periodic table is tantalum, iridium, and germanium. They are so far from each other. But can you imagine if we put the three elements together, it make a semiconductor with a three EV band gap. Okay, and now my question for you guys is, can you assign the oxidation states to this tantalum, iridium, germanium? No, we can't. Okay, we can't. And there are another like very interesting compound is the 18 electron rules to predict the half Hoistler structure, the stability of the half Hoistler. And it's usually it's XYZ. We put XYZ together from the periodic table. We take the early one, late one, and the middle one. Okay, so that's the XYZ. And what we find out is if you can calculate their valence electron to be the 18, and usually that's a semi-metal or semiconductor. Okay, let's take uh, this example, lutetium, PT, bismuth. And where's the valence, uh, what's the valence electrons for the lutetium? So lutetium is here, and the 4F electron is so localized, so we just uh, count as three. And the PT is 10. Okay, PT here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So bismuth, bismuth, uh, D orbital is fully occupied, so it's five. So three plus, 10 plus 5, that's 18 electrons. So this is a semi-metal. Okay, so that's what I want to tell you guys is, for the intermetallic, now we think about there is no boss anymore because if it's charge balanced, it's, there is a boss who get electrons and who donate, who donate electrons. In the intermetallic, there is no boss. Everyone work together, okay? Let's work together and try to fill up the orbitals. So this is the way we, we can come up with, to, to look at the semiconductors in the system. And, uh, and for example, for the half Hoistler compound, is basically they try to fill up the five D orbitals, five D orbitals, and the three P orbitals, and the one S orbitals. And the total, that's the 18 electrons. So once you fill up all the orbitals, you get the semi-metal or semiconductor, okay? And, and of course, a lot of people already know the 18 electron rules, and it's like, uh, as the humorosity rose, it's long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> and what we were wondering is, okay, so if 18 electron rules works, is there any other electron rules? So this is the new compounds we made in our group. 
So what the idea coming from is, if we look at the, so like one day we, we, we just look at the, the compounds, the database, the molybdenum silicate. Molybdenum silicate is a semiconductor. However, molybdenum is here, MO, silicate is here, that electron difference, the electron uh, negativity difference is quite small. But if we put molybdenum and the silicate together, it's a semiconductor. And if we calculate the bond, is we find out it's like a 5D, 1P, 1S for the valence electrons uh, for, for, to, to fill up this part. So that's to say, if we valence electrons, we fill up the seven orbitals, total 14 electrons. We can make a semiconductor. So if that work, is the 14 electrons like a very general, can be a little bit general rules. Can we make the new compounds? So then we were thinking about here is the molybdenum. And we add one electrons, so rhenium. So we add one electron. And here is the silic. We reduce one electron, gallium. So we put rhenium, silic, gallium together. Can we make the same structure and the same semiconductor? Okay. So what do we do? Yeah. Uh, one quick question. Mm. For the tantalum, iridium, germanium. Tantalum, iridium, germanium. Yeah. Just yes. Yeah. Mm. Does the zental counting work on that one? Uh, zental counting, no. Okay. No, because uh, if we look at the zental phase, you have to, usually you, you need to form the polyanine yeah. cluster, but there, there's no, no polyanine. Polyanine. Yes, that's exactly the half hoist structure. Right. Right. Yes. Mm. Okay, so, <coughs> so now let's come into the flux growth methods. Okay, what we do is we use the gallium as the flux and we put one to one ratio of silica, uh, rhenium silica and with a lot of gallium as flux and what we get is we get a new phase. This is the rhenium gal uh, gallium silic phase and if we put rhenium silic with a lot of gallium as one to two ra ratio we can get the rhenium silic. You can see this is the plate, this is the cube, they're completely different. Okay, and then we solve the crystal structure. This is the molybdenum silic or rhenium silic too. And you can see this is the rhenium gallium silic. This is the rhenium, this is the molybdenum, this is the gallium, this is all the silic. Okay, they look almost the same, but it's ordered. And the 14 electron rules works very well. And we also try to use the aluminum to replace the gallium. It also forms the very ordered uh, rhenium aluminum silic. Okay. So then we look at the compounds, the orbi molecular orbital. So we find out for the rhenium gallium silic, it's the 4D orbital <coughs> with 2P orbital and 1S orbital. And the total together, this is a 14 electron. And in the beginning, I was thought it's 5D orbitals, 1P orbitals and 1S orbitals, that's 14 electrons. Now it turns out it's a little bit different. But this is makes me think about, well, if 4 plus 2 plus 1 works, 5 plus 1 plus 1 works, then theoretically we can have all kinds of combination. 5 plus 1, 5 plus 2, 5 plus 1 plus 2. Like 4 plus 1, and so on and so on. Okay, so, so now, now, so because, because intermetallic, we don't have a very strong, like I get electrons, you give electrons. We all collaborate together. Theoretically, we can find not only 18 electrons, we can find 10 electrons, 12 electrons, 14 electrons, 16 electrons, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay, so what we have is here, you can see, so that's, that's too late, that's, that's too early for me, okay. So like tantalum arsenic, this is the wire semi-metal, that's the first wire semi-metal, and then based on the tantalum, okay, and the molybdenum carbon, so you can count molybdenum has six electrons, carbon has four electrons. And this is, has the topologic electrons, also it's a superconductor. So that's 10 electrons. And then 12 electrons, okay. So iron silica, if you put iron silica together, it's a semiconductor. And it's the 12 electrons. And if you calculate the band, ca band structure of cobalt silic, it's the same. Uh, at the 12 electrons, there is a big band gap. Okay, that's very interesting. Okay, and uh, recently we are working on the vanadium aluminum three. Vanadium aluminum three, can you imagine this is also a semi-metal? And if you count the valence electrons, is vanadium is five electrons. And aluminum three times three, total is 14 electrons. Okay, so there are many, many choices. Oh, yeah. So in the 18 count rule, I, I mean, I can understand to some degree that there's a full shell 
kind of uh, thinking. Yes. But in all these other ones, do you have, is there some, you know, deeper understanding of, you know, why 10 electrons? Or, is, or are you just thinking about the bonding being similar between the two, the two compounds? Okay, so this part, okay, I understand your question. Your question is um, 18 electrons, like it's well accepted because we have the 5D orbitals, 3P orbitals, 1S orbitals, we fully uh, occupied. And for the other, like 10, 12, 14, and it's kind of like not well known. So why we think uh, in this way? Okay, so first of all, uh, I asked this question when I was a uh, postdoc. So then my advisor told me, Okay, if you have this idea, you prove it. So what we did is, okay, so we just uh, do a very simple thing. The simple thing is we fill up the band and we put all this band. We didn't do a lot, so we just use the model. And we have the one S orbitals, two, so we have the S orbitals, P orbitals. And what we did is, S orbital, 3P orbital, and then S orbital, 3, and so, and so on, and so on. We do different ways. So this is the orbital occupancy. And theoretically, we have two electrons. Or this is like six electrons. And two electrons, six electrons, 10 electrons. So what we did is, so this is like, uh, we can think about is, this is integrated density of states. And now we do the Gaussian distribution. Okay, and we do Gaussian distribution, and we adding one, adding one, and the Gaussian distribution we use different the width. Okay, from the point five to four, and what we figure out is for the gap around the eighteen, the gap is huge, so that's why most the compounds we can see is eighteen electron. For the fourteen, it's also huge, but it's smaller than the eighteen. And for the 12, for the 10, it's like a little bit. So what we see is, so that's my feeling. Okay, I'm not, yes, that's my feeling is, yes, that's my feeling. So my feeling is, yes, 18 electrons, we can see a lot from the database. 14, we can see also a lot, like the Chimini letters, okay. 12, we may see something. So we need to be very careful to look. 10 is the same. Okay, we, we keep in this in mind. That's why when I saw it, I got very excited. Okay. Okay, so that's... So, so basically, is if we want to look for the topologic materials, we just look at the density of states. We try to look for the gap or pseudo gap, right? Gap, pseudo gap, that's what we like to see. And now let's talk about superconductor. Superconductor, what we think is, for the density of states, we are now we are trying to look for the peak. <laughs> okay, so what is superconductor? What is superconductor is, like what we see is, superconductor has very uh, two important characters. The first one is, it has the exposure of the magnetic field. If we put superconductor, uh, if we put the ferromagnets above the superconducting material and the cooling the superconductor below the critical temperature, the ferromagnets will be lifted up. And uh, this is because it has the exposure of the magnetic field. And uh, this phenomenon is called Mansler effect. Okay. If we can make the superconductor into the magnetic levitation chain, there will be no contact between the chain and the rear. That would be very cool. And the other one is the zero electrical resistivity. It's the same if we cool superconductor below the critical temperature. The resistivity will drop to zero. And if we can use the superconducting material to transfer electricity, we can get the zero power loss. Okay, so it, yeah, it's like a very, very commercial benefits if we can make the room temperature superconductor, okay. <laughs> however, however, the first superconductor was observed more than 100 years ago in Mercury in 1911. After almost a half century, the first superconductivity theory was proposed. That's the BCS theory. And after another 30 years, the first high TC superconductor was discovered and by accident by the chemist. Okay. <laughs> so why I emphasize the chemist? Okay. So after another 20 years, it's also the chemist find out the ferromagnets. 
no, no, find out the second uh, high TC superconductors in the iron arsenic compound. And Oak Ridge did a lot, lot of studies and understand the materials a lot. Okay. So I like making new superconductor very much. And my group spent a lot of time to find the new superconductor. The reason is because, for example, the topological materials, the magnetic materials, you know, physics really no physics than chemist. So <laughs> it's very hard to do better job if they can make the good sample. Okay. But Superconductor is different story. It's because nobody knows what's exactly going on for the superconductor. So if we have a very magic chemistry intuition, we can make new superconductors. Yes. <laughs> and what's, what's like chemistry, a way to understand this superconductivity? First of all, superconductor. For the conventional superconductor picture, one thing like people kind of agree with, everyone kind of agree with, is the Cooper pair. So if we think about the Cooper pair, you can think about this is the electron pair, okay? They make the pair, but not as strong as the electron pair. Okay, these Cooper pairs, they make the superconductivity. And that's the only equation in my slides. This is the equation, uh, like generated from the BCS theory. It tells us the transition temperature in the superconductivity is related to the strength of the electron phonon coupling, as well as the density of states at the Fermi level. Okay, so electron phonon coupling is something it's very hard to get from the experiment. Okay, however, the density of states is kind of easy and straightforward, we can see. So the density of states, this is energy, this is the DOS. For the topologic insulator, we try to find out here, this is the topologic. Now for the superconductor, we try to find out here. Okay, why? It's because if we have a large density of states at the Fermi level, we are supposed to have higher TC. That's what we try to find out. However, there is a risk is if we have a higher density of states at the Fermi level, we have a higher risk, the structure will get distorted. So like we couldn't make the phase. So in the end, it's a balance. It's you want to make the phase, you want to stabilize the phase. You also want to have the unstable electronic structure. And this unstable electronic structure get balanced by forming the Cooper pair. Okay. So how can we do it? So we find out very weird things, unusual things. For example, it's the uh, unstable oxidation states, like the tin. So this is the two papers to work done by the famous group in Japan. One is the Hoseno's group. So Hoseno's group said tin arsenic is a superconductor because in tin arsenic, tin shows the three plus. <laughs> and the Tukuro's group said, okay, tin phosphor do the similar things and it's under high pressure. So it's also a superconductor because of the three plus. Well, let's not talk about if the three plus is true. So, uh, so, so assume everything they did is correct. Now the question is, we are thinking for tin, as we know, we have tin 5s2, 5p2, and the stable oxidation states will be 0, 2 plus, 4 plus. And if they propose three plus, that's unstable. And now they forget another one is tin 1 plus is also unstable. Can we make this one? And how can we make this one? And here, we're starting from the tin phosphor. Okay, still starting from the tin phosphor. And we are thinking if we can come up, like put the calcium into the system, or strontium into the system, or barium into the system. And this will give two electrons. And the phosphor will have three minus, and the tin will be theoretically, if it could be, it's the one plus, okay? And how can we make it? So now let's review what we learned from the Dr. Brancel's lecture. We make the crucible, okay, we put the sample into the crucible, and we have the coarse wool, <laughs> yes, because this is not very good. <laughs> See, it's not very good. That's a bad example, okay, this is a bad example, because we, are, we don't have a lot of money to buy a very fancy crucible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so what we do is we use strontium with phosphor with tin as 1 to 1 to 20 ratio. And then we cool very slowly and spin. Okay, what we get is not, not very big crystal, a little bit. Like uh, not very fancy big crystal, but it's like 2 millimeter times 2 millimeter single crystal. But it's enough for us to do all the measurements. And we find out that the structure is quite simple. It has like 6 atoms per unit cell. Phosphor tin, strontium, strontium tin, phosphor. 
And if we look at it in the layered way, is this is strontium phosphor and tin. Okay. And it's a superconductor. Okay, now let's review a little bit. If we want to prove it's a superconductor, what kind of measurement should we do? First, we need to prove this is the Mansell effect, right? And we need to measure the magnetization. And the Mansell effect means they have expulsion of the magnetic field. So it shows the negativity. Okay. And the other one is the zero resistivity. See, there is a big job for the resistivity. Okay. And the other very important things is for the superconductor, like before the superconductor, that's a normal state. And after we make the Cooper pair, now it's another superconducting state. So there is a phase transition. So we need to measure the heat capacity, specific heat, to prove this is a real bulk superconductor. It has an entropy change. And now we prove it, okay? Again, on Friday, you will get more like talk about the specific heat measurements. And you will learn more about that one. So now the other question is, does the thing has the plus one <laughs> oxidation states, right? So we do the XPS. So XPS is a good technique for you guys, for us to know what's the oxidation states. And we couldn't find the reference for the thing one plus because nobody claimed that one. But one thing is, it's not two plus, it's not zero. And it's not four plus. And it's only have one single valent in the compound. Okay, so, so then, now coming to the chemistry, how can we explain this one? Is in chemistry, we have a very, very like fundamental. It's called two, two electron, two center. It's like the pi bond, chemical bonding. We have two and we share one bond. Uh, so it's the similar in this compound. And the tin and the tin, they form these layers, the tin tin layers. Everyone contribute one electron. Everyone contribute one electron. We make a big, big pi bond. Okay, so that's how we make superconductors. We don't need to know a lot of physics, right? We don't need, <laughs> we just play the elements and we measure it, okay? And the last question, I will go very quickly is, that's really the question we are thinking about is, can we combine these two together? So is there any way we make a superconductor in the gap or near the pseudo gap? as well as it's a superconductor. So, so this is will be a very important, like for the future direction is, people try to see if we can combine the superconductivity with the topological together. Okay, so how can we do that? Again, we need our imagination and find the rules. So what we did is, there is an old compound people study a lot, is iron gallium three, luthenium gallium three. And this compound is the same. Iron is here, luthenium is here, gallium. Actually, gallium has a larger electron positivity than iron and luthenium. But if you put them together, it makes the, see, the big bend, bend gap, semiconductor. And this is the gallium cluster compounds. And there is another one, like people didn't pay too much attention to the superconductor. It's molybdenum gallium because it's too complicated a structure. Most of the physics don't, are not interested because physics like simple and make the perfect physics in a simple model. But chemistry, we are not scared of complicated. We like it, okay? <laughs> we got very excited. Oh, yeah. It's 10 Kelvin superconductor. And now we wanted to look at what's the band structure, electronic structure look like. So we calculate the density of states of the molybdenum 8, gallium 14. And there's one thing we notice is there's 18 electrons, molybdenum gallium 4. Okay, so this is 18 electrons, there is a real gap. However, our superconductor is at 21 electrons, around 21, 22 electrons. So that's to say, actually we can play this electron counts a lot, we can tune if these galliums like have the different occupancy or like the distortions. And <coughs> what we did is we used the different ratio. However, it doesn't change. It always forms this stable molybdenum 8 gallium 41 phase. And then we think, okay, if gallium doesn't work, let's work on the transition metal. And we also find out rhenium gallium is a superconductor. Iridium gallium is also a superconductor. It's around 22.5 electrons. And now we are thinking about molybdenum, rhenium. How about luthenium and rhenium? So there is no rhenium gallium compound at all. And then we were thinking about, can we make it? 
So again, we use the flux way to grow the crystal. We didn't grow the large crystal, but anyway, we make something. And this is rhenium gallium 5. This is the new phase. And rhenium is in the center. There are nine gallium surrounded. And also, it's a very beautiful cluster compound. And OK, now let's review again. Superconductor, what we need to, to measure? Magnetization, right? Superconductivity, the resistivity drop to zero. And the heat capacity, we see the phase transition. OK, three. One, two, three. And it's like very straightforward. Chemistry people have no problems to do this work. And it's a superconductor at 2.1 Kelvin. And now let's calculate the band structure. So did you see a very beautiful pseudo gap? And then the band gap after you applied, after we applied the spin orbital coupling, the band open. Okay, so we haven't calculated the surface band structure yet, but it's very interesting, I think. So that's the basic idea. And this is the phase, a new, completely new phase. Okay, of course, this like electron counting is not what I come up with. <laughs> so I like reading Professor Ro Hoffman's paper. And he give a lot, lot of much deeper insight about the electron counts than me, okay? And I also like another professor, Jeremy Burdett, work a lot. So this is like, I, I, I know this is like a winter school, and the professor JP told me, oh, you need to tell students very fundamental things. So I really go through everything and make the slides one by one. <laughs> okay, so in the end, I really appreciate these opportunities to, to know more and more students and a lot of people. Thank you very much.